Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study for New Week. And uh, we have a lot more to look at in trying to understand um, Daniel's last vision, especially as it relates to the present time. So we, in, we want to invite God's Spirit to instruct us. So let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful uh, that we can come here in the morning and open your word together, and that uh, we can share the things that we are learning, and that we can uh, be united even though we are apart physically through thy spirit. We just ask now that as we look at the book of Esther again, in the context of Xerxes and Trump, that you can give us wisdom and understanding. Help us to understand these things we read, that we can share them with others, and that they will have an effect in our lives. Give us for our sins, help us to cling to you in spite of what we see in ourselves. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so good morning again, everyone. So we were yesterday, or not yesterday, Thursday, looking at this, and um, we, had, we were addressing Esther's decree and uh, both Esther's decree and uh, Haman's decree going into effect and trying to figure out what these way marks are in our line. And I'm of the view that these are still future, but we might find that there's something different that we haven't seen yet. So we're going to look at this a bit more. And uh, one of the things we had addressed was um, this golden scepter. So we know that there's um, a golden scepter is held out when Esther makes her plea. That's on the 16th day, of the first month of the 12th year. And we know that that date is the date for the wave sheaf offering, sometimes called the wave offering, sometimes called first fruits. Um, and uh, that, um, that, of course, starts Pentecost. Uh, the count for Pentecost, so it doesn't doesn't begin. Pe Pentecost is 50 days later, but it begins that count uh, seven weeks <clears throat> to get to the 50th day, which is Pentecost. Now, um, things about this date, of course, we're marking it as because uh, the date is April 20th, 474 BC, but we're lining it up with the 25th of December in 2021. And the reason we do that is there's 3,291 days from uh, uh, the beginning of this stirring up all against the realm of Grisha that occurs on April uh, 14th, uh, 483 BC. And so uh, we know that's 11.9 because of the other symbols uh, there. So we're going to start that as 11.9. And we know from 11.9 to December 25th, 2021 is that many days. So what we've done is we've taken that symbol, that number of days. We said we're going to take what, what occurred in our history um, uh, as, as a symbol begins on uh, December 12th or December 21st, 2012, right? That's the Mayan calendar count. So that's the whole prophetic mirror. I uh, hope I'm saying this all right, because my mind's all jumbled. But the point is we say that that December 25th, 2021 is going to mark the end of that. So we got that November 19th, November 9th date, 2019, which is connected to December 25th. That's 777 days. So that 777 days is part of the 777 chiasm, which is 3,291 3, days. So we just think that that's, that makes sense to place it there, December 25th, 2021. Now, that's an inclusive count. Um, the other option we have is to actually make it... Um, um, well, I guess that's the best way to do it. Um, so we're just taking that symbol. Okay, so let's let's leave it at that. We also have the 384 days, 
uh, between uh, December 6, 2020 and December 25th, 2021. And so that also helps solidify the idea that it's December 25th, 2021. Um, because we line up December 6 with, um, with that and it's the 20th day of the ninth month. So you have that one year period, it's the two 20th days of the ninth months. Um, so, so there's lots of different things that we looked at also from our Vashti being deposed, the 3,108 days, um, to the 16th day of the first month. And, and we have to remember too that 3,291 days is going to uh, Haman's decree itself. So it's, there's that three day period. It's a symbol of the prediction before midnight. And we know in Millerite history, uh, midnight is July 21st. And three days before that is that July 18 um, symbol, which is three days before midnight. So the fact that we have a three days there um, is significant. I probably should put that in somehow. Um, so let me see how we can do this. Um, I'll just blow this. Simply this way. This is probably easiest. What did I do wrong there? No, I see what I'm doing wrong. Never mind. Let's do this right. I'm just going to put it here, like a three here. There we go. So we just got a three days there, similar to what we have in the way that I put it in. Uh, and we have those periods of three days in Ezra. Just put a three there. So we have lots of these symbols, the prediction before midnight symbol. Um, and we know that when it, we dealt with the, uh, December 25th, 2021, we, we used it as this symbol of three days. So there was other things we connected three days, even to December 6th, 2020, uh, going from December 4th to December 6th. So uh, the point is we, we have all of these sim symbols in place. Now there are some things that we need to address and Dwight wanted to address some points. Um, so, Dwight, you wanted to look at Esther chapter 5 in the Apocrypha? What I said, yes. We need to, we need to consider that, that portion fairly carefully. Yeah. Now, in your email, you talked about Artaxerxes. Why, why were you mentioning Artaxerxes? Because you mentioned Artaxerxes long, get long Germanus. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, since I, I wrote that kind of late last night. Oh, so you weren't thinking? I was, you know, I was thinking that we're dealing with Artaxerxes long, long Germanus. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're dealing with uh, Xerxes. Okay. Right. <clears throat> okay, so that's. Now, now, it's true that they, uh, the Jews ended up later on, and that's one of the. Uh, the things about uh, the second century BC is that the Jews had a very poor understanding of this period of time. They lost a lot of information. Uh, they believed that uh, Ahasuerus in Esther was actually Artaxerxes Longimanus um, for some reason. And that's just because they had this, because uh, the term Ahasuerus probably is best to translate it as Artaxerxes. So even in the King James, when it says a Hazareris, that's actually, you know, you could just say it's, it's another form of Artaxerxes. 
And that's why it's really weird in, in the book of Ezra, in chapter 4, when it has these, um, uh, the, the reign of Ahasuerus, which is, of course, talking about Cambyses, and then uh, Artaxerxes, which is talking about false Smyrnas. Well, in some ways, these these two titles are considered almost the same word. Doesn't really make much sense. Um, you know, it's just one's, uh, it's just like a different transliteration of the same title. And so these are actual titles. Um, even Xerxes is probably still a title, not a name. So it, it, it's rather complex because they had different names that they used in different contexts. And, and then also you're dealing with the fact that you have some Persian kings that, um, you know, they're being written about by other nations. Um, and so they're going to use the titles, um, but they put them in different forms. So it, it's, it's always been rather confusing to people regarding this history. Now, there are people who actually believe that the story of Esther is the story of Artaxerxes Longimanus. That was the view of uh, Samuel Snow in his first writing of uh, what we might call the Midnight Cry. So in his February 16th, 1844 letter that was published on February 22nd and republished on April 3rd um, in 1844, he actually took the position that the story of Esther is talking about Artaxerxes Longimanus, right? So um, later on, he corrected that. But the reason why he had that view is it was actually a view that was held by many different people. So there's different views about how to sort through all of these uh, these kings. But anyway, so you wanted to look at Chapter 5, and you had talked about, uh, I mean, the, the thing that I was focusing upon was this golden scepter. Right. Right. And, and, I, and I'm mean? in agreement with you on that. Well, in what way are you in agreement? That we need to be focusing on this, not as a not as a strictly a literal situation, but as a figurative situation. Yeah, and and the question is, how does it help us understand these these way marks? Because we have uh, so the golden scepter would be held out on both the formalization of the second angel's message and. Uh, the empowerment of the second angel's message that is with Esther's plea and with Esther's decree when Esther's decree is issued. So on those two occasions, which are 66 days apart, we have this golden scepter being held out. Now, now you had a suggestion, suggestion that it might have something to do with the constitution. Right. Right. The, the, the point that in the time in the past that we went over this in Esther 5 and comparing it with Esther 5 1, the, the situation in Esther 5 1 reads very similarly to Esther 15 1. So Okay, so Esther 5, 1 and, and 2 in the Apocrypha are just the sa exactly the same as Esther 5, 1 and 2 in the King James, um, like without the Apocrypha. Um, no. Um, okay, so if I look at the King James here, it's the same. We have, we have in 5, one in the King James, I agree that that it says <clears throat> in the King James, now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house over against the king's house. Mm -hmm. And in the Apocrypha, it says, and upon the third day, when she had ended her prayer. Right. She laid away her mourning garments and put on her glorious apparel. 
and then 15.2, and being gloriously adorned after she had called upon God, who is the beholder and savior of all things, she took two maids with her. Yeah. So, yeah. so, yeah. so what, I, what I'm trying to say is that if you look at Esther 5.1 in the Apocrypha, it's going to expand uh, the King James, uh, the first two verses of the King James. Right. So that these first two I mean, verses, yeah, these first two verses of the King James, these are just expanded in those verses. So this is a shortened version of that. So when you get to verse three, they're 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 the same. Right. That is, I mean, you shouldn't say they're the same, but that's just that we we no longer have this apocryphal Esther. We just have the the Hebrew, right? So this is this is the Hebrew you're looking at when you're looking at the King James, and then you're looking at uh, this Septuagint when you're looking at um, whoops, hit the wrong one. When you're looking at uh, this one, so this is really the Septuagint, uh, the Greek, right? So they have that. Those first two verses are then expanded. And that's why they have. Esther 5 1 and then later on Esther 5 2 here. Right. So that's going to be addressing that. And so when you get to verse 3, we, we now have the Hebrew. Okay. So but they just, these, are the, these are the things that the Greek adds. Yeah. Okay. So in the in the apocryphal in the Greek. Yeah. Esther 15.2 introduces the idea that she took two maids with her. Right. So we knew that in this, in the apocryphal Esther, we have this representation of uh, Esther is the third angel. Right. And these two maids represent the first and second angels, how we understood it. So, and, and that, I'm agreeing with that. Mm-hmm. In 15.3, and upon the one she leaned as carrying herself daintily, or the alternate reading, delicately. Yeah. And, and the, the other was following, bearing up her train. Yeah. So the, the premise that we addressed when we looked at Esther to begin with is the one that Esther leans upon could be a figurative representation of the second angel's message. Right. Right. And, and the, the one, one carrying her train would be the first. Right. And that would make sense in how we understand the second angel empowers the third, but you need a, you can't have a second without a first. So Agreed. The first is following behind, right? Agreed. Yeah. Okay. So what we're dealing with here are figurative representations. Mm -hmm. Now, here again, in 15.5, and she was ready through the perfection of her beauty, and her countenance was cheerful, and very amiable but her heart was in anguish for fear so here again the third angel's message is indeed a fearful message to be presenting Mm -hmm. and the alternate readings whether we're dealing with the ruddy or rose colored mm-hmm. it would be a a message i mean that we could say was being offered in its purity in mm-hmm. its youthfulness yeah when i um and then how she's uh anyway um so we have also xerxes trying to understand what he represents right and and then of course you you know you said well what does Mordecai represent? Now now Xerxes represents I mean God 
is the way that I think that we would look at this story because he's going to be the one that holds up the golden scepter and, and pardons her. Um, but in some ways, it, it also represents, I think, the Constitution. Um, that there's something about about this that because it, it, it's addressing the Sunday law in some way, but in a typical way, because we know the third angel's message is the message of the Sa Sabbath Sunday issue. Okay, now, uh, so, yeah, one of the one of the points from the chat, Sister Angela had shared about this that in First Samuel fifteen thirty three. Agag okay. came to Samuel delicately or cheerfully, not knowing he was about to be executed. Okay, so, and this is pretty interesting. I mean, yes. just from the point of it's 1533. Right. So this is a wonderful manifestation of the power of God. And um, so, and so this is obviously, um, so that's in, so, Cheerfully. Uh, 1532. 32. Then said Samuel, bring hither me Agag, the king of Amalekites. And Agag came to him delicately. And Agag said, surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, as thy sword hath made woman childless, so shall thy mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Right. So, um, so this is some kind of a judgment that you can see that this is the contrast then to what happens to Esther. Exactly. Right. And we got this in 1533. So this is, I guess, in contrast of the holding out of the golden scepter. So there's represents two classes. Okay. So, so that's an interesting so, point. And then the, the balance of this, from the Apocrypha in 1506. Then having passed through all the doors, she stood before the king who sat upon his royal throne and was clothed in all his robes of majesty, all glittering with gold and precious stones. And he was very dreadful. Reminds me of William Miller's dream. Well, it reminds it, it reminds me of what took place in the book of Acts as well. Because uh, which, where in the Acts? Didn't, didn't Herod stand up before the people in all of his robes glittering and yeah. make statement about, you know, how great and powerful he was and then he was struck down? Yeah, but this is a different type of story. I don't know if I would connect that story. Okay. But um because Herod's not not a good figure here. Xerxes is representing God in this context, but also representing the message as it's been to me in the second casket. Okay, that's that is an excellent point. Yeah. I mean, okay, now for everybody else in the study, are we are we tracking with what Theodore is presenting here? So you have the casket, you know, it gets scattered, and then it gets all gathered together, and then it's you know shines ten times brighter. It's a larger casket, and all the the coins and precious stones and all those things are now in order. And so to me, it would represent that message being formed, uh, being put in place. Right. So here we have Esther 5, 2 and 15, 7 being compared. Yeah. Where in, in the King James or in the Hebrew, and it was so when the king saw Esther the queen standing in the court, she obtained favor in his sight, and the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the tip of the scepter. Right, so that's just 
basically that whole part dealing with the scepter and everything gets just expanded in the apocrypha right yeah <clears throat> because, because the apocrypha then lifting up his countenance that shone with majesty he looked very fiercely upon her and the queen fell down and was pale and fainted and bowed herself upon the head of the maid that went before her. Again, another support that yeah. this, if we're looking at this figuratively, mm -hmm. that that maid that went before her, the second angel's message, leads to the third angel's message. Yeah. And then, and this also shows, though, that there is this in this message shining forth this truth. You know, all the message put together in this casket, let's say, cause, right? Because he shone in his majesty and looked fiercely upon her, right? So this is the third message, and and so of course, message is connected with people. So this is to me representing the Sunday law time period. This conflict right. in in the third angel's message with the uh, you know God's law and man's law. Okay, and then of course then she's going to lean upon this maid, the the which would be the uh, the second angel. Right now, it leads into. I mean, what, what would have been a another thought, because it's so marked within the in the Apocrypha. So 15.8, then God changed the spirit of the king into mildness, who in a fear leapt from his throne and took her in his arms till she came to herself again and comforted her with loving words and said unto her. So... In this situation, the king, I mean, the, the thought that this could be the constitution is the king or, you know, however, you know, the way that we're examining this right now. God's law. Or God's law, yes. Is, I think, a, a quite a bit better fit than looking at this as a person. Right. So yeah, so we wouldn't we wouldn't take in this part of the story that Xerxes represents Trump. Because it, it doesn't fit even with the idea of the Sunday law. Because even though Xerxes uh, is the one who issues this Sunday law in in chapter three. When we go through the rest of the story, Xerxes isn't behind the Sunday law. It's it's Haman that's behind it, right? Right. And Correct. Xerxes is doing everything to counter that Sunday law, right? So, I mean, if you were going to have uh, Xerxes being Trump, then you would have to have Trump opposing the Sunday law. Could we... But, would we look at this that Xerxes is unaware of the far-reaching import of the Sunday law? Well, so the way that... Ask question. I'm sorry. Okay, ask a question there, William. The, uh, if, well, when Haman came to him with the decree, did he not know what was in that decree? Okay, so this is this is the point that I'm trying to make, is that in the first three chapters, we have a type of the Sunday law, and Xerxes represents Trump. And Trump is deceived, and that is representing everything that occurs under the pandemic. That is the place where Trump is. But now when we move to chapter four and onward, we're addressing a different narrative. 
So this is a repeat of history. This is representing the Sunday law as it's going to be manifest in the world, in the United States primarily, right? That's how we've been looking at it. Did people understand that that's what we've been doing? I understand your point. Right, so we, so we say, yeah, Xerxes represents Trump, but not after chapter three. Well, but he knew, but he knew what was going on, though, didn't he? He wouldn't have signed it if he didn't know. No, Xerxes didn't know what was going on. He didn't. He didn't understand what was behind Haman's Haman's decree. He didn't know who these people were, right? You know right. what it meant, right? He just he just said, "Well, this sounds good. You know, these people are in trouble. Just you know, take care of it." Um, but the point is, the first. Because that's in chapter three. So the first three chapters are addressing the first, second, and third angel's messages. The third angel's message is the Sunday law, but it's representing it in our history, right? So this is where we're, you know, when we look at these lines, as we're going to look at them in more detail and try to figure out what's happening here. But when we look at these lines that we've drawn out, <clears throat> you know, it, we're going to have Esther's uh, plea. So we're going to have, you know, Haman's Sunday law, Esther's wedding. And then we're going to have Haman's Sunday law, right? And that's going to be tied to December 25th. But, but not really. It's going to be tied to three days before December 25th. That is, December 25th represented the Sunday law. But what's, what's being represented here is is the 16th day of the first month, not the 13th day of the first month. And so when we deal with this formalization and this empowerment, you know, I'm saying that, that this is, um, so this is addressing events that are still future. So once we get past that December 25th, 2021, and we look at the rest of this story, well, these are gonna be things that are future. Right. And in a sense, I mean, we're going to be chapter four, chapter five, uh, chapter, you know, all the way through to the rest of the story. We're saying that that is actually the Sunday law. Right. But we can see that in our history that Trump has this role um, in that initial history because we have the second angel arrives December 6, 2020. Now, this is more about within this movement. When we look at this line. Uh, this first part, this is about stuff happening within the movement. This is about the message of Trump, his role. And uh, so this, this line, the line of Esther, which is going to contain this type of the Sunday law, it does include the pandemic, but it also includes, as we go through the rest of Esther, the actual Sunday law that's going to exist in the United States. And in that line, we don't have Trump. Right. Trump is not. He's not bringing in a Sunday law. Right. That this is this is not talking about Trump as a person any longer because he served his role. That's that's the view that I've taken. And um, so, you know, so we're going to continue examining this. But definitely we can see that there are, there's a change that happens here in the book of Esther. And Xerxes isn't the one who is, during this period of time, seeking for a Sunday law. He's actually going to issue a decree to counter the Sunday law. So if you're saying that, if, if somebody's saying that Xerxes is Trump, and Trump is going to be the one bringing in the Sunday law, it doesn't really bear out in this story. Xerxes is not behind the Sunday law. Haman is. Right? He's the it's it's his Sunday law that he has set in force. And Xerxes is seeking to counter it and actually puts a counter decree so that God's people can protect themselves. So Xerxes here in this context doesn't doesn't appear to be the one behind the Sunday law.
I mean, and I'll, I'm going to ask this question, Brother William. Um, in looking and considering your point, was Xerxes aware of how close to home this decree was going to strike? I don't think so, no. Okay. Now, in, in the situation that we have all lived through over the last three years, was Trump aware of how the efforts of others were, especially the those that are more considered as the globalists, how far reaching their position was going to be in trying to take control of things in using this pandemic? I wouldn't think so. I don't think he realized what kind of trouble he got himself into. No, I don't think okay. so. Now, the the issue that, that I've been looking at is that, like what, what Theodore is presenting right now, here is Xerxes. We have Xerxes that gives the approval to a decree to go forward, but then comes back to give God's people the ability to defend themselves because he does not understand the intent that Haman has had. And, and the point, too, is that in the first three chapters, Xerxes represents uh, Trump. And it represents that history, the history of the pandemic, all those things that go from um, November 9th, 2019 to December 25th, 2021, that history. Right. So that's uh, that's Esther one, two and three. Right. Mm -hmm. right. right. But, but when we get to Esther chapter four now, we, we can't say that Xerxes is representing uh, Trump. Xerxes isn't even representing the, the power that's bringing in the Sunday law. Right. Everything that Xerxes is doing is to counter that Sunday law. Well, that's what I, I, I agree with you on that point, because yeah. because why would you? Why would you turn? Um, why would you turn face after you done made a Sunday law and try to reduce it? I mean, that, I understand that. Now, now Colin has tried to to argue. Well, you know, there's the dance of deception, right? So we go to you know to Herod and go to the priests of Baal, and um, but that deception happens in chapter three, right? So we have all the rest of these chapters that are not addressing Xerxes as somebody who is now deceived, but as somebody who is delivering God's people, right? And it's through this process of these messages, right? Esther now with the, because we're using the Apocrypha, the two maidens or attendees, right? The one that she's leaning upon, the one carrying the train, and we can see that that represents the first and second angel's messages. So, so we have a completely different line in some ways. That is, we could draw this all out as a separate line. Now, I, what I did here with this is in this line that you see in front of us, this is just the dates that are given in the book of Esther. Right. Okay. And, and then we, we, we looked at them and we said, can we create this as a line? So we can. But when we look at this line, um, Xerxes is not, um, you know, what, what we see in, under the first message is different than under the second message and under the third message, right? So, so Xerxes has this, this role all the way up to 
I mean, he issues this decree, but it, even here, it's not about the issuing of the decree. Notice we don't have the date for the issuing of the decree on this line. We put the 16th day of the first month. Now, the reason why we put that date rather than the 13th, even though it's there in those three days, um, uh, was because of the, the, the symbols that we get of that 3108 inclusive days. So when we count from uh, the 10th day of the seventh month when Vashti is deposed, and we count to Esther having this golden scepter um, held out, that that's going to be 3,108 days, which is seven times, se or four times 777, right? So it's it's this, this symbol of of this period of time. And and 318 also has other symbols attached to it. Even Colin has used 318. So what is 318? So we have 3108, but what is 318? Where, where's the first place we run into 318? I think it's like Genesis 13 or 14. Okay, and so what is that? Yeah, Abraham's servants. Okay, and can you explain it for me? Why, why that's 318? Because it just gives it three, it says there's 318 servants. Right. So there's 318 servants. Okay. And what what does that mean? What's the symbol that's there? What why why are we talking about? Where is that exactly? That where we get the 318. I can't remember all from. I was going to say it, Daniel eight thirteen. And three wow. one eight is, of course, as Iran pointed out, eight one three in reverse. Right. Yeah, we know. So it's related to Palmoni, right? But but the first place we get it is this three hundred eighteen servants, which I just don't know where that is exactly. Um. I don't see it offhand here, but anyway. Um, now we also have it in in other ways. Let me see if I can just quickly. Um, I'm going to do it this way. So back in um, 2019, uh, and it really started in 2018, um, and Stephen should remember this, what was the 318 that you presented? And before you answer that, Stephen, if I can interrupt for a second, uh, yeah. look at the doubling, Genesis 14 and 14, I think we'll give you your answer. Oh. Okay. So it's in Genesis 14, 14. And when Abraham knew that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born of his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. So we have it in, in a doubling verse, 14, 14. Right. And 14 is the doubling of seven. Correct. So, so we can say it's seven, seven, uh, seven, seven times seven plus seven times seven. Or not, right. seven, not seven times seven, but seven seven plus seven seven, right? So you got this this doubling of seven in here, which would relate to uh, the the seven times the seven 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 prophetic mirror. Okay, and then um, but Stephen, right? What, what about the three hundred and eighteen days for, that you had in two thousand eighteen? What was that? Yeah, so from Pentecost in 31 AD yeah. to the 22nd of October 1844, 
It's yeah. 18 times 359 plus 318. Right. So you have this 318 days, and the 318 days uh, you put into a time period. Uh, you did something with time there. So what did you do as far as time? You took 318, and you said, well, that's a day for a year, right? So is 8318 divided by 359 or 360? I didn't do that. That was uh, 1844 times 359. Yes, yeah, I know. But then when you took the 318, you had to put it into hours. So it was 21 hours. Um, so I think you just had multiplied it by 359, 318, or divided it by 359. So you yes, ended so up, yeah, so with 21 hours, 15 minutes, I'm just doing the calculation right now. So, and yes, 21 hours, 15 minutes, and 33 seconds. 33 seconds. Yeah. To the nearest second, I think. <laughs> yeah, just rounding it up to 33 seconds because it's 32.590529, etc. Okay, so. Um, so it's 30, so it's 21 hours, 15 minutes and 33 seconds. And then we could put that into an analog clock and we would see a cross and you'd be looking at the, from the foot of the cross, from the left side, looking up at the cross would be the perspective. If you had it as a clock, that's what it would look like. Yes. Can you run by that one more time about the, 318, what is it? Okay, so so Stephen had um, back in 2018 when he was uh, first looking at um, this, where he's first got November 9th. And um, so there was this calculation. Uh, I guess I'm just trying to figure out the best. I think this one does probably give me the best. Um, okay, so I'll show you this here. So this is just an, an email I sent to a bunch of people back in October 14th, 2019, but it was just me finally understanding it. It's not like that's the first time it was understood. And, uh, so this is the email. So I talk about this study uh, that is counting the number of days from Pentecost in 31 AD to October 22, 1844. Um, I'm not going to go into the whole calculation, but there's a remainder of 318 days, which amounts to 21 hours, 15 minutes, and 33 seconds. Okay, okay. I just I just was out. Uh... And then it goes to the time when Jesus, when Jesus Christ died at the ninth hour. And it brings us to the Mark 1533, when there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. So 1533 ties us to 1533 BC. It also ties us to Genesis 14, uh, 14, right? Okay. Yeah. That's 318 days. And then we also had this other verse um, that Angela brought up, which was for Samuel 15, uh, verse uh, at, at 1533, that, uh, which I'm just trying to figure out where it is, it's just dealing with uh, Agag. So all these things kind of come and connect together. But um, uh, the diagram that's drawn then, is if you put this on a clock, that's what 9.15 would look like, and 33 seconds. So you, you would see how the hour and minute hand would create this, uh, the cross piece of the cross, you know, where the arms are placed, and then the second hand would come down like this. And so this would be looking up at a cross. You're on the left-hand side of the person hanging on the cross looking up, right? So on the right side of the cross from your perspective, left hand 
from Christ's perspective. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, that's the that's the idea of the three eighteen. So we so we've come to this three eighteen sort of in a roundabout way. Um, I got to get back to here. <clears throat> so why are we talking about the three eighteen again? Because of this 3,108 days. Okay? Correct. Okay. So this 3,108 days is 777 times 4. And that's part of, in, in our 777 prophetic mirror, there's four periods of 777 days. With 183 days in the middle. <clears throat> two, two on either side with 183 days in the middle. So... So the point is, all of this ties together. We can see how this structure, this chronological structure, has to be there. What, what we can't see is this second angel empowered, Esther's decree, which is this counter decree to Haman's decree. We can't see what that is in our lives. That is, I don't believe that I can say, Esther's decree, which is the empowerment of the second angel, is, is some date that's already happened in our lives. I don't think it has occurred, right? That is, that is the midnight cry symbol here. Whatever this line is, uh, this is still something future. Now, maybe we could attach a symbolic date to it. I don't know. But, you know, if we count from... Uh, you know, December 25th, 2021, I mean, you could count 66 days. It's not going to give you anything. So, so we don't know what 66 days represents other than it's a symbol of the Sunday law. And, and so maybe there's something in our future, but in some ways, all three of these following way marks are somehow connected to a Sunday law. That is the way that I would look at it. Really, actually, all the four, if you go right from the second angel being empowered, because we marked that as a Sunday law. So maybe these are future lines, way marks. But the point that I'm trying to make is that whatever's happening in this story of Esther, is it something still in the future that we haven't experienced yet? Because I don't believe we've experienced Esther's decree, this counter decree, to Haman's decree, but maybe we have, maybe there's something I'm not seeing, right? I'm just saying, I, I don't see it at this point. This June 25th, 474 date. Yeah, okay, so somebody else has a thought on this. Well, you were, as we're going through this, of course, we started back on this because of the 318. Yeah. We pointed out that if the if the numbers are rearranged one way, we come back to eight thirteen. Yeah, so we have the symbol of Palmani, which is is you know a symbol. And then you pointed out one eighty three as well. Yeah. So the yeah. only one that we haven't really haven't really placed in there would be eight thirty one. Well, August thirty first. Right. Or or the eight the thirty first day of the eighth month, which you could never have as a biblical date. But you could you could have the No, you couldn't, okay. Yeah, eight it, could, it can be the first day of the ninth month, but you know that's I, I just think it's August thirty first, um so August 31st is a date in our lines that is in 2013. Because on August 31st, 2013, that's when Jeff asked the question about calculating um, Ezra 7-9. What date would be the first day of the fifth month in Millerite history? Okay. And it's on that 
paid that I do the calculation. That a year later, um, um, Noel is going to present, right? So I did the calculation there and then. So we had the answer on August 31st, 2013. But it's not going to be until the CAP meeting in June 22nd of 2014 that we get the answer given to the movement, right? Because I'm just nobody. So Jeff asked the question. I do the calculation. I know the date. But, you know, nobody knows about it. I, I didn't share it with anybody because I was just still trying to understand what it meant. And, you know, so and it was the last day, you know, the last Sabbath of the camp meeting that it was presented. So, <clears throat> you know, the, the question was presented. Um, you know, so we have August 15th uh, as a symbol then found at that time, but it's going to be on August 31st, 2013. <clears throat> so all I'm saying is that August 31st is a symbol that that ties to Palmoni, right? Just on, on itself. And then... Um, the difference between this 308 days and the 3,291 days is 183 days. So again, we just have this, this symbol keep repeating itself. So Angela asked a question, which I was kind of wondering about. Now we have this um, 2,688 day extension of time we pled for. That is, this is an application for an additional extension of time to file your taxes, right? This is the form number. And, and that's the November, uh, 20, November 24th, 2022, that we discover this symbol and it ties us to this, uh, April 5th, 2030 date. Um, so is this like a counter decree? And so, so in considering the different dates in our history, um, I don't know if I would say it's a counter decree. I mean, it's, it's time in which we are given. Now, um, you know, maybe it's the plea, right, where we, um, so that it is possible. I mean, it is possible because you've got Esther's plea, which is going to, be December 25th, 2021. And then you have the 66 days. Now, now what can 66 days be? I mean, obviously we know that the symbol is 66. So that's just part of 666. But isn't six number of man? Yeah, yeah. But I'm just talking more like mathematically. Okay. Okay, so Iran says it's two months and six days. Okay, so what does that that do? What does that give us as a symbol? Two months and six days. Well, depending on what part of the of the biblical calendar we be talking about. Is it two months and six days or is it two months and seven days? One of 30 days and one of 29 days plus the remainder. Well, we're just using it here as prophetic. prophetic. Okay. So prophetic months. So what we're saying then is in two prophetic months, we're talking 30 plus 30. And then, we're talk and then we're talking about the six, but that isn't that also three plus three? Yeah, but I'm not sure what that would mean as a symbol. Three angels' message, three persons of the Godhead. I mean,
Okay. Uh, excellent point, Stephen, that uh, the 18th of March is the 77th day of the year. And then Angela has come back that 66 is double of Christ's age at death on the cross. Yeah. Okay. Um, Hmm. Well, I think, you know, two months and six days can symbolize Pentecost uh, as well. Um, just because, you know, two months and then the sixth day, right, which is the third month, but... Um, which is where Stephen's going to count uh, to get that 318 days remainder. But I don't know um, exactly what it means. So as far as trying to attach it to some date in our history, um, you know, if we did it as 66 months, so a day for a month, right? so you can do that, you're going to get 1980 days and you know if we counted from um december 25th 21 i know we're, we're spending time just trying to figure some things out but that it's okay to go through this process And it doesn't really do anything as far as I can see. Okay. So from what I can see here, I can't figure out, um, you know, what that event is going to be. That is, I can't to tie it to a date. That's, that's all that, that I can see here. That there's nothing that can that we can take that the symbols there yet and say this is uh, this date. I mean, we look at the date on the biblical calendar. It's the 23rd of March. Like if we wanted to look at it that way, um, right? It's the uh, the 23rd day of the third month that the decree is issued, Esther's decree. And um, we, we did look at that before in uh, like this year, if we went back to um, the 23rd of March. And that's gonna be the first day of the first month in 2023 but we don't really have anything attached to that that i know of like in march 23rd 2023 we don't we don't have any event so so i, I just don't think that we we can do that it does attach us to the, that symbol though the first day of the first month in 2023 so You know, I'd kind of have to look back in my history and see if there's anything about that date that that is meaningful. Okay. Um, anything else? That we can get from Esther chapter five.
right. so we <clears throat> go ahead. Okay. Well, we, we know that. Okay. So we're saying that Esther chapter five, this is going to be um, about this banquet. So there's going to be these two banquets. The question is, why is there two banquets? Why does she have the first and then the second? Because the second is going to be on the 17th day of the first month. Well, <clears throat> to finish, I mean, I'm, I hadn't gotten as far as that, that those two banquets. Yeah. What I was looking at with the Apocrypha was mm -hmm. that when Esther comes, of course, comes before Xerxes, she falls into a faint and is leaning upon the head of the maid that went with her. And then we have this, we have Xerxes being changed in attitude. Mm -hmm. He's more uh, in a mild attitude. Mm -hmm. He leaps from fear from his throne, takes Esther in his arms until she came to herself again and mm -hmm. comforts her with loving words. And part of what she says, or part of what the Apocrypha states, is in Esther 15.10. Because in 15.9, the question is asked, Esther, what is the matter? I am thy brother, be of good cheer. Thou shalt not die, though our commandment be general, come near. So is this giving us the, the premise that unless the scepter is held out, that the, the party would, approaching, risk their life? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, because then in 1511, and so he held up his golden scepter and laid it upon her neck, where in 15.3, mm -hmm. his comment is, <clears throat> then said the king unto her, what wilt thou, Queen Esther, and what is thy request? It shall be given thee to half of the kingdom. Which, of course, we would see supported out of Mark 6.23. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so you're referring then to uh, the death of John the Baptist. Right. Yeah. So we have that same parallel here. So, so we do have a parallel between Herod and Xerxes, but in contrast... So the question that I've got here mm -hmm. from the Apocrypha in the doubling verse, 1515, she is, after she has been embraced by Xerxes and the golden scepter is laid upon her neck, he embraces her and says, speak unto me. In 1513, Mm -hmm. said she unto, that, unto him, I saw thee, my Lord, as an angel of God, and my heart was troubled for fear of thy majesty, for wonderful art thou, Lord, and thy countenance is full of grace. Mm -hmm. And as she was speaking, she fell down for faintness, faintness, or she fell into a swoon for faintness. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we could even look at this as, you know, Daniel falling down. Um. You know, this is the 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 looking glass vision, right? So that's what I would attach to this, and that's why I'm saying this is a contrast to Herod, because Herod, even though there's some parallels here to Herod, um, I mean, there's definitely a contrast in the story. This is not to do something bad, right? This isn't going to be the head of John the Baptist, um, so. But the fact there are some similarities to that story, we, we need to take that into account. Right. I would agree with that. Yeah. So <clears throat> this portion from the Apocrypha ends 
that the king was troubled and his servants comforted her. Mm -hmm. So then we come into this with the with the feasts. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have first the feast, then you know the plan for the next feast, uh, then Haman building the gallows, right? So I don't want to go through all this. That is, I think this is talking more about the Sunday law, the preparations for the Sunday law in the future. But here in this story, um, even though there's these parallels to, to Herod, and we know there's that dance of deception, we don't see that here, right? Xerxes is not being deceived here at this point. So this is in a contrast to that story. This is Agreed. a counter to that story, not a uh, a complement to that story. It's a contrast. Now, some people could say, well, the contrast can speak the same thing. But we know there's a counter decree that's issued. And that counter decree has to be something that comes from God, not from man. So Xerxes here in this story is representing uh, God or at least God's law. Which I think is an, is an interesting application. Because when we're dealing with this commandment being addressed out of the Apocrypha, <clears throat> it's not talking about the decree as much as it is the the law of making the approach to the king. Mm -hmm. And then you've you've got two other comments in the chat, one from Angela and one from Stephen, that I think tie into this very well. Okay. Okay. So the two feasts, sixteen one and seventeen one, is thirty three. Point two, which mirrors two three point three, yeah. So it, so it gives us some some numbers there, and then Angela has uh, three two three two three is a mirror, right? So we know that that date, that's the twenty third day of the third month. If we put it in twenty three, right? Right. So, and that's the first day of the first month in twenty twenty three. Now, what we can say about the first day of the first month in twenty twenty three. Is it is seven biblical years from the first day of the first month in 2023 to um, the first day of the first month in 2030, right? So we can say that. So so let's say we we go back to our chart to our diagram. So we're going to take that date, that um, date here, 23rd day of the third month. Now, this is in the 12th year of Xerxes, but we're going to put it into uh, March 21st. March 20, is it March 21st or March 23rd? 23rd, 23rd <clears throat> sorry, uh, 2023, which is the first day of the first month, right? Now we know it's gonna be for master's plea, uh, 323 inclusive days to the decree going into effect. And um, so we have this March 7th, 473 BC, that's gonna be the 13th day of the 12th month of the 12th year. 13 times 12 times 12, is 4 times 12 is 144 times 13. So you got 1872 as a symbol. So I'm just going to put that here. So we got that there. But then we also have this, this symbol. So we know that we have... We know we have in our line this symbol, the first day of the first month in 2030. Um, I don't know if we can put it on this line or not. 
right? So maybe we can, maybe we can't. I haven't, I haven't, uh, I don't know if we could somehow tie it to this. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, I mean, I could say, well, we could put, you know, April 5th, 2030 is the next way mark and just say this is seven years, right? To the, to the next way mark, which, um, you know, and I don't know. I just, I'm, I'm just not willing to do that. I'm not willing to say that this is some date in the future or, or some date that's already occurred. Right. I'll just we just have those symbols there, whatever they mean. Now, we do have March 7th uh, in our lines. Right. I mean, we have it in uh, uh, 2020, uh, 2021. We have a March 7th, 1700 days from March 7th, uh, 321. So so we have March 7th in our lines, but I wouldn't try to put these in here. One is because they come later or earlier, so this is a later way mark. Um, but I do want to note the connection between this March 7th, which we've talked about, and um, the March 7th in uh, 321. So we know it's 793 years. Now, um, when we look at the March 7th in uh, that's going to be in 2021. March 7th, 2021, we're going to begin the study of examining the foundation, right? Right. Okay. So, um, let me see here. I'm just reading here about Trump's birthday. Okay. Anyway, um, so so we have March. So that's going to be seventeen hundred years later. And if you take, I'm just going to do it here. I'm going to show it on the screen so you can see what I'm doing. Um, Okay, so if I take 793, that is that first period uh, from when the decree goes into effect to Constantine Sunday Law, and um, I think what I have to do is I have to do, um, um, so that's going to be, the whole period of time is 2,814 years, right? So you're going to count from, pardon me, that's not right. So I have to go um, 473 plus, I'll just do it the simple way, plus um, 2020 because I'm just not doing that. So it's going to be 2,493 years. And I'm trying to remember how I did this. Okay. Maybe it wasn't what I wanted to do. Um, okay, so what I had done is I had taken um, and that's how it goes. I do it backwards. Okay, so if I take this period of 2,493 years and I divide it by 793 years, I get an approximation of pi. Right? You see that there? That means that uh, this 793 years compared to this whole span of time from March 7th, 473 BC to March 7th, uh, um, I'll switch screen so you can see this. I have it on this chart. 
Okay, so here we have Haman's decree, right? You can see that there. And there's 793 years. So that's when Haman's decree goes into effect. To Constantine's Sunday law. And then we have 1700 years from Constantine's Sunday law to uh, 3721, right? So March 7th, 2021. Three times seven times 21 is 441, which is reverse of 144,000. And 12 times seven times three, that is reading it backwards, is 252, right? So you should be able to see that there. Okay. Uh, 12703 in the book of Esther. With the, yeah. there, there are actual years that are mentioned concerning Xerxes. So it talks about his third year, his seventh year, his twelfth year. Yes. Okay. Good. Yeah. So we can see how that relates to the 252. The third year, the seventh year, the twelfth year are the years mentioned, not counting the Apocrypha, right? So the Apocrypha has, mentions the second year, but the King James uh, from the Hebrew only mentions the third, seventh, and twelfth. Okay, and then we have um, so anyway, if I take that span of time and just I'm just taking years, seven hundred ninety-three years plus seventeen hundred years. Gives you that 2493 uh, years, right? 2493 years divided by 793 gives you an approximation of pi, you know, just to two digits. Now, if I'm even more precise, so what I did here, I have this calculation at the bottom. I'm going to use pi. So I'm going to take the whole number of days, which is 910,000. 568 days, and I'm going to divide it by pi, and I'm going to get 2,893 days, and then I'm going to subtract the actual number of days left over. It equals 200 days minus 13 days, which is 187 days. I know that that's, you know, confusing, all right? And March 7th is the 66th day of the year, by the way, right? So I don't know if we mentioned that. Uh, we were talking about looking at Savannah, but March 7th itself in 2021 is the 66th day of the year. And then there's 13th days to, of course, the March 17th, 2021 date on the Julian calendar. So if we were using all Julian days, so that's why I have the 200 days minus the 13 days to get the 187 days. So I know it's rather complicated calculation. I don't want to go to it in detail, but the fact that pi connects these dates is significant, right? And, and with a difference of 187 days. Would we agree with that? It makes it very interesting. Okay. I have some other calculation in there too, which I'm not sure what I was doing, but um, okay. Yeah. So, so we have this approximation of pi. So that means that there's a relationship between Haman's decree, Constantine Sunday law, and March 7th, 2021. So maybe we could make the case that the counter decree is typified by um, <clears throat> what we studied beginning on the first day of the first month. Well, okay, this is the first day of the first month in 2023, right? But we began studying this on March 7th, 2021. It's not in this line. But that, that, that somehow is typifying what's going to happen in the connected with this symbolic date, right? I, I don't know if that makes sense to people. But that these are, are symbols. So somewhere that March 7th date in our history, where we begin to study these things, we, we examine the foundation first, 
And then we're going to do, you know, understanding the lines after that with another little study in between. Um, but those studies are typifying what's going to happen. That is something in the future. Now, now we put the March 23rd, 2023 date, date there. And we're going to say, well, that's the first day of the first month. And Esther's decree is somehow connected with that. That's the empowerment of the second angel's message. So the second angel's message is December 6, 2020. Then we have uh, December 25th, 2021. And then we say, well, March 23rd, 2023. But we don't have an event on that date that I know of. It's a Thursday. I don't know that anything of significant happened on that day, anything significant. Um, but we have it there as a symbol. And then we can say, well, you know, maybe this has, you know, something to do with uh, just as a symbol being seven years, biblical years prior to uh, April 5th, 2030. And then you would say, well, maybe April 5th, 2030 represents the Sunday law. Maybe that's the, uh, the next thing in these lines. Now we have 256 days, right? Um, this period of time between Esther's decree and the decree going in effect. And we know that can represent June 25th, the 25th day of the sixth month in which Esther's decree is issued. Um, So I don't know what to do with the 256 days other than the symbol. It's um, two to the power of eight or something like that. Anything else about that? Okay, so then the other thing that we have is we have Constantine Sunday Law, right? So, so we put it here as the fourth angel arriving. So we're saying Constantine Sunday Law is a Sunday Law, right? Correct. Okay, and we're, we're saying that those two Sunday Laws are connected. That is, what happens in the story of Esther is typifying the first Sunday law. They have the same date on the Julian calendar. The period of time, 793 years, is um, that part, the, the parts of a Hebrew day um, that is that, that extra part. Um, uh, so it's 793 Halic, which is simply uh, 44 minutes and one helic, right? So that is if you take 793 um, you get uh, I'm going to do that here 793 times 3.3333 because a helic is a three and a third seconds in length and you get uh, 2,640 40 seconds plus three and a third seconds. So 2,640 is a symbol. So 792 helic is 2,640 seconds. You divide that by 60, you get 44 minutes. So, so it's 44 minutes and three and a third seconds. That's what it represents. So it, it's something that's part of dealing with the calculation of the length of a month. Because a month is 29 uh, days, 12 hours, 44 minutes, and three and a third seconds long. 
Okay. So, so anyway, we're, we're, our time is up. So we're going to come back to this tomorrow to address Constantine Sunday law and, um, what that means. Okay. So any final comments before we close with prayer? Okay. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study today and the things that we are learning and the things that we don't understand. We ask, Lord, that you can continue to enlighten our minds and help us in our personal study, in our prayer, in our lives. We give everything to you, and we ask that you can guide and lead us today. Be with each person, watch over, and bless them. May your angels take care of them. May your Holy Spirit speak to them. And to those watching these videos online, we ask that they can have an open heart and mind and that they can search these things out in your word. And we pray this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.